this year, we're going to focus on vascular surgery. Now, the reason that I say vascular surgery in particular is that although these are really just referring to vascular conditions that will frequently show up on, for example, your medicine shelf examination, USMLE Step 3 CK, at the same time, these are really also essential for your surgery shelf exam, and therefore we are going to be very deliberate about going through the workup and management of these conditions in detail. These are going to include vascular claudication, in addition to contrasting this with neurogenic claudication, as this shows up on examinations all the time. We will also discuss subclavian steel syndrome, carotid stenosis, acute arterial embolus, and compartment syndrome. Additionally, we will conduct a very thorough review of the aneurysms, including their workup, surveillance, and management. Additionally, as you navigate questions on examinations that are related to these various vascular conditions, there are several key modalities that we have at our fingertips, both in terms of workup as well as management, that are going to be essential. These include, first and foremost, our physical exam, which is going to allow us to appreciate ulcerations, gangrene, as we can see in this patient, as well as other symptoms and signs of vascular disease, for example, poor hair growth, secondary to a lack of blood flow to a particular region. Additionally, we are going to utilize the ankle brachial index, or ABI, which we will discuss in detail in the coming slides. We frequently use ultrasound in the context of vascular disease, as this can allow us to take a closer look at the potential for carotid stenosis, as well as in the screening of patients for the potential development of aneurysms. We will also see that angiography can be utilized. And of course, we also have our interventions, including revascularization, surgery, as well as various medications. In this particular clinical image, this happens to be a fasciotomy in the case of a patient who developed compartment syndrome. As we mentioned on the previous slide, we must familiarize ourselves with the ankle brachial index, or ABI. And the ankle brachial index is something that we can obtain very simply by simply getting the systolic blood pressure of the patient's ankle and dividing that by the systolic blood pressure of the patient's brachial artery. This is done quite literally by putting first the blood pressure cuff around the patient's ankle and taking the systolic blood pressure from that reading and then doing the same for the patient's brachial artery and simply dividing the blood pressure we receive from the patient's ankle by the blood pressure we receive from the patient's brachial artery. We can then determine based on this value or ankle brachial index or ABI whether the patient has the presence of peripheral arterial disease or PAD. If the patient's value, once we obtain this fraction, or ABI, is less than or equal to 0.9, then that patient is said to have an abnormal ABI that is consistent with PAD, or peripheral arterial disease. If the patient has an ABI that ranges from 0.91 to 1.3, then that is considered to be normal. And in the case of a patient who has an ABI that is greater than 1.3, then this is consistent with calcification of the vessels and does not necessarily represent PAD. So please, please, please become familiar with the ankle brachial index, or ABI, as this is something that we will utilize frequently in the evaluation of patients with suspected peripheral arterial disease. One condition in which we are going to frequently utilize our ABIs is going to be in vascular claudication. In vascular claudication, our classic patient is going to have pain in the lower extremity, particularly with walking or exertion. This pain is going to be relieved by rest, However, this pain is not going to be relieved when the patient bends forward. This is in contrast to the quote-unquote shopping cart sign that we see in our patients with neurogenic claudication. And this is something that we will explain in more detail in the coming slides. Additionally, patients with vascular claudication may also present with impotence. This is classically the case in patients who have aortoiliac disease. And the pathophysiology of vascular claudication is going to be atherosclerosis, particularly of the large arteries. This can be appreciated in our schematic in the center of our presentation, where in the case of a patient with a healthy artery with no atherosclerosis, they're going to have unobstructed blood flow. Whereas in our patients who have a plaque or atherosclerosis, this is going to disrupt blood flow. And ultimately, this is going to be reflected in our ankle brachial index, or ABI, because if a patient has blockages in some of the large vessels, for example, in the iliacs or in the lower aorta, then as blood flows throughout the patient's body, there's going to be a difference in the blood pressure reading that we get from the patient's ankle as opposed to the patient's brachial artery. In particular, the systolic blood pressure in the patient's ankle is going to be less than the blood pressure that we get from the patient's brachial artery. This is why patients with peripheral arterial disease and vascular claudication are going to have an ABI that is classically less than 0.9. This occurs because when we divide the systolic blood pressure from the patient's ankle by the systolic blood pressure from the patient's brachial artery, the systolic blood pressure from the patient's ankle is going to be lower than this value from the patient's brachial artery, resulting in a value that is going to be under 1, and in this case, less than 0.9. On physical exam, patients with vascular claudication are going to have cold extremities, as well as decreased pulses and sparse hair. 
all of which are consistent with poor blood flow to the region. Additionally, as we discussed previously, we're going to calculate the patient's ankle brachial index, or ABI, by dividing the patient's systolic blood pressure from their ankle by the systolic blood pressure from the patient's brachial artery. As we stated in our initial review of ankle brachial indices, or ABIs, if the value generated is less than or equal to 0.9, then this is going to be an abnormal result, which is consistent with peripheral arterial disease or vascular claudication. Therefore, if the patient has an ABI that is less than or equal to 0.9, then this patient has a diagnosis of vascular claudication, and we should ultimately have this patient perform a walking program, as engaging patients in a structured walking program has been clinically proven to improve their symptoms. In addition to getting patients on a walking program, we also must encourage these patients to stop smoking, as this is frequently a cause of their atherosclerosis. Additionally, we can prescribe these patients solostazole, as well as in some cases aspirin and clopidogrel as antiplatelet therapy. And although these measures, which are highlighted in blue, of starting the patient on a structured walking program, telling the patient to stop smoking, as well as starting them on an antiplatelet regimen, are essential in the management of this condition, for patients who do have progression of their vascular claudication, we should consider getting a CT angio and ultimately proceeding with an angioplasty, or in some cases, vascular surgery. This must be contrasted with neurogenic claudication, also known as spinal stenosis. In spinal stenosis, our classic patient is going to present with low back pain, as well as pain in the legs with activity, much like our patients with vascular claudication. This pain may be referred to the buttock or to the thigh, and ultimately this pain is going to be worsened with extension, standing, or walking. However, the real key in distinguishing neurogenic claudication from vascular claudication is that in our neurogenic claudication patients, their symptoms are going to be relieved with flexion. Activities that produce this relief with flexion or forward leaning of the spine include leaning on a shopping cart, walking upstairs as this involves bending forward, as well as biking in which the patient is in a leaning forward position. And therefore, this distinction between neurogenic claudication and vascular claudication is extremely important to keep in mind for examination purposes. The pathophysiology of spinal stenosis is degeneration of the spine. This ultimately results in a narrowing of the spinal canal, which causes compression on the spinal nerves, thus producing the claudication symptoms. In our typical healthy patient, in our schematic on the left-hand side of the presentation, we can see a normal spinal canal opening. However, as we can see on the right-hand side of the presentation, if we have this abnormal narrowing of the spinal canal, this is ultimately going to compress on the spinal cord, thus producing pain in the symptoms of neurogenic claudication. As we stated previously, patients with neurogenic claudication or spinal stenosis are characteristically going to have what we call the shopping cart sign, in which leaning forward of the spine is going to result in improvement of their symptoms. And therefore, this patient, when leaning on her shopping cart, if she has improvement of her claudication symptoms, and this is highly characteristic for neurogenic claudication or spinal stenosis, and this shopping cart sign is something that we are not going to see in our patients with vascular claudication. On physical exam, our patients with spinal stenosis are going to have pain characteristically with back extension. However, our best test in evaluating these patients is going to be with an MRI. We discuss in more detail in our modules on back pain exactly when to get MRIs in the case of a patient with back pain. In terms of spinal stenosis, however, in terms of management, our first step is going to be to provide the patient with physical therapy and NSAIDs. From there, we can progress to corticosteroid injections and ultimately may need to resort to a laminectomy.